Hello everyone, it's time for this week's live stream. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. I was still trying to get things sorted and get it perfect before the camera was turned on. So, uh, today's topic should be a good one. I was on a live stream with Reef Bum uh, a couple nights ago, and one of the things we talked about was Old Tang Syndrome, and I thought, you know, we've never discussed the potential or the risk of having Old Tang Syndrome in our aquariums and how to avoid it. So I want to get into that with you guys today. Um, <clears throat> just a little bit of stuff to tell you about first that has to do with the reef tank. Can, can I give you a little update? The tank itself just had a water change about <laughs> 30 minutes ago, and I changed uh, about 53 gallons. Remember I did a video a few days ago where I talked about diluting the salt water? And I did that, and I did one water change, and I had the barrel sitting here for a couple of days with a pump making noise, and I said, I need it out of here for the live stream. Let me go ahead and make sure that the alkalinity is right, which I buffered it up. I made sure the temperature matched. I made sure salinity was the same. And then boom, I did my little water change and you can barely tell that I've done anything, which is great. Because, you know, normally after doing a water change, your tank might look a little cloudy. And while I was in there, I thought, you know, I'm going to do a little pruning and I'm going to do a little trimming. I'm going to take out some things that don't belong. So I removed a couple of these little pest anemones that don't belong in there. I scraped them out. I took out a couple of dead coral frags. One I'd gotten recently from someone. He was worried it wasn't going to make it. And then we put it in my tank and it didn't make it. So that one's gone. And over here, the shadow caster had a branch that came off, and it was a lower branch that Dwayne told me to trim, which I did not want to do. But he said the shadow caster is doing what it's, it's designed to do, cast shadows, trim that bottom one, so that way the corals underneath will have light. I was like, yeah, he's right, my arm's wet, I might as well do this. So I went ahead and I trimmed it, I put the nice uh, explosion of new branches in the core to fill it in a little bit more, make it more bushy. And then this front one had come off and was down here and knocked that one down. So I re-glued that, I removed something that was here and put it over here, I put that branch back where I wanted it, and uh, that should take care of that part. I also planted a coral right there next to the um, Anacropora, because it's one of those things I should have moved a while back and I needed to. And I put a bird's nest in that back corner by the sea bay, I can almost point to it right there, you can almost see it. Anyway, I did some of that stuff. And then when I was done, I knew that I had rough house with my dog. Uh, we, we play rough. I mean, I just can't help myself. I like to get her riled up. She's got a bunch of teeth. And uh, so she chewed through my arm and left a, a wound. And then she felt really bad. And she's licking it. And she's like, I'm so sorry. And, you know, we're all good to go. But I reach into my saltwater tank with my wound, which happened yesterday. It wasn't like super fresh, but my skin has been um, broken. There is the opportunity of getting a disease into your bloodstream. It's dangerous. So I just want to give you a heads up. If you ever are in that situation, obviously clean your wound regularly, which I did. And then what I did, as soon as I was done working on the tank, I went ahead and applied some peroxide directly to the uh, couple of scratches I had on my arm. So that way I can li uh, uh, limit the risk of an infection, you know, taking place or taking root in my system, because obviously I don't want that. So if you are reaching into your tank, I mean, usually the best bet is don't have any open, uh, open wounds. But if you do have some, keep them clean, keep them dry, uh, disinfect them on a regular basis, and then hopefully they'll just heal up rapidly and you won't have to tell your doctor, oh my God, what is this flesh-eating disease that's happening to me? And how on earth could my aquarium have done this to me? Because there is some stuff in our tanks that can get you. So I want you to be aware of that. Um, I received a replacement EB-832 from Neptune. So, you know, I sell their products, and so I get a little bit of special treatment compared to the average Joe. But uh, in the case of this one, I had one that was messing up, and it was on this live stream. You guys saw it. Uh, it was turning the pump on and off and on and off and on and off. So I removed it and took my backup, which a friend of mine had actually uh, fixed for me. His name is Mike. And I put that one on the system. And then I had to copy all my code over, and I went to that whole explanation with you guys last time. And then discovered and mentioned also, I'm just repeating it for those that didn't see that live stream, there's an option called module copy in Apex Fusion now. So you can tell it, copy this one, which would be broken 832, to new 832, and it'll copy everything over and I guess delete the old, which is fantastic and so much easier than what I did. You know, I think you could do that in one minute, where I probably spent about 15 minutes copying eight outlets over and trying to mimic everything perfectly and make sure everything's named the same way. So my new replacement came in, and it's here. It's my backup, so I'm good to go. Also, I had a customer place an order for a Vortec. He ordered a MP40, 
and I only had one left. And this one's actually mine because I ordered it for myself months ago for the Anemone Cube. You know I've been replacing all my Vortex because they're old. And the one in the Anemone Cube is an old style. It's got the quiet drive, but the body is different than what's in this box. And I wanted to replace it. And so I saw the order come in. I was like, oh, no. So I called him up and I said, is there any chance that I can send you your order next week? Because I need this one right now. And he was super nice. And he says, yeah, no problem. I understand. It's, it, I'm just adding an extra one to my tank. There's, it's not that pressing. So what had happened with my tank was on the Anemone Cube, I looked at it yesterday, and I noticed that the Vortec wasn't moving any of the tentacles on the Anemones. And I thought, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know reset it. So I turned it off and turned it on. And it was flashing, I think, red and green, red and green. I was like, oh, what is happening? Why? Why are you doing this? And I went ahead and I unplugged the cable and plugged it back in. Red and green, red and green. And I was like, well, I can't remember what that, me that error message is, but obviously it's <laughs> something's not right. And then I thought, huh, I'm going to go ahead and unplug the wires from the driver. And I'm going to plug in just the battery backup because I have that huge battery array that I set up last. Uh, hmm. When did I do that? I don't know. July or August is when uh, it was during the very beginning. It was like episode five of Reef Diary. And Mike came over, the guy that helped me with 832, and he helped me wire everything up. And so I have this giant bank of batteries that can run all my Ecotech gear for 24 hours straight on a single charge. And I just said, let's see if that'll make the Vortec run, which it did. So I isolated that the Vortec works. It's working in battery backup mode, but the power supply doesn't work. And I looked through my whole bag of parts of used stuff, things I never threw away, and I found so many power supplies, and only one matched the one that I'm using right now which was 24 volt, 2.5 amps. And I tried changing it out and it didn't work. And so the brand new one probably has the exact power brick I need. And that is, so I haven't opened it yet, but I'll, I'll do that after the show. And that will get me operational. But for like the last day, I've been running the Vortec in battery backup mode. And because it's the only thing sucking juice on the batteries, it shows on the front of the driver, there's 10 dots. And the, the dot that's lit shows how much battery is left. And my battery is at 100% the whole time. So, I mean, it could kind of run indefinitely at a slower speed. But I just want to get it back to operational. So I'm going to go ahead and handle that later. But uh, it's, it's nice to have some things in place to keep your tank running when something messes up. And in this case, uh, I, my battery backup was the way to keep the pump running for now. Because, you know, trying to get a, po a power supply rapidly is not always that easy. Even the... I found one of the power supply where the numbers were close, but the plug didn't fit. The, the, the end of it is just slightly different than what fits into a Vortec driver. So uh, that's all the aquarium news I have for you. And uh, let's talk about old tank syndrome. Okay, so first of all, it's kind of this ongoing, uh, I don't know if it's a myth, or a rumor, or, or a, a, a tradition. I don't even know what terminology to, to point to old tank syndrome, but people would talk of it. And a lot of people would say, I don't know, maybe it's old tank syndrome, which is kind of like throwing up a white flag saying, I have no idea what's wrong with my tank. I'm just going to assume it's old. So the question is, how old would you consider to be old enough to deal with old tank syndrome? What in your brain is telling you right now? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it 30 years? I mean, what number have you assigned to something being old in your care? And in my case, my tank is eight years and uh, two months old and uh, doesn't have old tank syndrome. <laughs> so what could be the, the causes that make someone give it that nickname? Well, basically, usually what it is is that the things are going wrong in the tank and you can't isolate the problem. You can't find the solution and you're desperate and you just decide I'm just going to drain it down to the, to the glass. I'm going to take everything out. I'm going to start a brand new tank because nothing's working well. I mean, yeah, I could understand that feeling. When my tank started messing up last August, I was very stressed. My blood pressure shot up. And uh, I did, a, I did a, a reef diary talking about how much I was freaked out. <laughs> and then I spent the next 10 days wondering what the heck is going on with my tank. But old tank syndrome never popped into my brain. Uh, usually, 
when people want to discuss old tank syndrome, they usually want to blame the sand bed. So let me ask you this. If you have a tank that is 10 years old and it has no sand bed, can it have old tank syndrome? Or should it be old sand bed syndrome? <laughs> I mean, these are some things that if we don't find specific things to point at, it's just kind of a crazy, weird saying that doesn't solve anything. And it's just kind of, like I said, it's throwing your hands up in the air. It's the white flag and you're just giving up. So we don't want to give up. We want to figure out what's going on with our tank and we want to solve it. But how do we avoid even the potential of something called old tank syndrome? All right, so some of these things will seem familiar to you because I kind of preach about them quite a bit. And that is that I tell you to clean everything. Clean everything. Nothing goes uncleaned. Wiping everything down, scraping things clean, inspecting seams, uh, cleaning your skimmer, cleaning the skimmer pumps, cleaning the return pump, checking your frag rack magnets that hold it onto the glass, checking your cleaning magnet, checking your feeding magnet. Um, what other things have magnets? Our return pump, our skimmer pump, our gyres, our vortex, any kind of pump that uses a magnet to make things happen, a probe holder, a top-off kit holder. These are all things that we love using our magnets for to get everything in place and make it easy to put wherever we want and remove it if we need to and put it back into place where if something's bolted on forever, you're kind of married to that spot. So for example, a probe holder that's glued into your sump forever means your probes will always go there and you have no options. You can't raise it, you can't lower it, you can't move it side to side. It's just in the way. Where a magnetic one, you can put it wherever you want in the sump, but they can fail. And it doesn't even matter what brand. I've seen Vertex ones fails, failed. I've seen uh, Neptune Systems fail. I've seen others fail. People have done the suction cup things. I mean, the best thing you could use as a probe holder that I can think of, you know, off the top of my head, would be make one completely out of acrylic and then, you know, build it so it's got a shelf and then goes up and then over and down and you set it on top of a baffle where it can literally not be bumped. And one of the benefits of having your probes in the baffles is as the water goes through your sump, it's going to go right through those probes as it goes to the next zone. So it's literally not in a dead spot and you'll get the best readings. And when you do a water change, the baffles hold water so the probes stay wet. Uh, so they're not going to be exposed to air. There's no risk of them being damaged. So that's kind of a nice thing. But I mean, it could be slightly in your way if you have like sponges between your baffles, but you can always, you know, remove them out of the way clean out the sponge, put the sponge back, put the probes back, but at least that's kind of a spot where there's no magnets, nothing to go wrong. But uh, I keep dwelling on magnets. Let's go back to the sand bed. If the sand bed is um, getting old like mine, mine was eight years old, I had decided last year to start doing some serious sand bed cleaning, something I hadn't done in pretty much the life of the tank. I very, very rarely do water changes as it is, and I definitely barely touch the sand bed. I let my cleanup crew take care of it. I let Flo take care of it. And my sand always is just sand with some detritus in it. I have Neisseria snails. I have cucumbers. Um, the Flo, like I said, moves things across. Hermit crabs walk across it. Uh, some of the fish, like the coal, will be nibbling on the sand. I mean, it's kind of interesting to watch that happen. So there's always something happening with the sand bed itself, but detritus will sink into it and it will get more and more loaded and I proved that because my tank had a, a high nitrate for a super long time, as many of you know. And when I removed all the detritus from the sand bed last year, my nitrates came way down <laughs> when no other product it worked. I mean, seriously, when you think about it, I tried all these products that are sold to hobbyists to help control a number, which was nitrate, when in the end, it just came down to me cleaning my sand bed. And once I focused on that, it made a big difference. So if we were trying to avoid old tank syndrome when it comes to a sand bed, I would say cleaning your sand bed once a year or once every two years would be a smart move. Some people like to vacuum their sand beds all the time. So you don't even, you will never have to worry about this as far as I'm concerned. Others of us that don't touch the sand or very rarely touch it because one of the rules was if you run a deep sand bed, do not touch your sand. Don't mess with it. And that kind of sticks with you. You just don't forget those kind of um, directions. And then, you know, after five years, six years, seven years, your tank starts acting up a little bit, it's finally time to touch the sand bed. But if you were to, you know, go through and work on cleaning the sand bed every couple of years, I think that you would avoid the potential of having something happen one day called old tank syndrome. Now, when you're cleaning the sand bed, there's really only certain areas you can do. 
Typically that would be whatever you can see that's exposed because the rocks and the corals are in the way. If you have a lot of things on the bottom of the tank, you're gonna have to go ahead and you're going to have to move them out of the way, at least temporarily. And you know, you can figure out whatever works best for you, whether you wanna take them right out of a tank and put them in a cooler with some of your tank water in it. So they're the same water just for that 20 minutes you're working the sand bed. And then as soon as you're done, then put them back in that spot and then work on the next area in a couple of days. I would not clean the whole sand bed in one day. And I didn't. Last year, I remember doing it once or twice with Caitlin. We definitely did the anemone cube a couple of times, which was its own sand bed that was also eight years old and had all these clownfish pooping on it every single day for all this time. And we pulled out a lot of brown detritus and it, the sand was really gross and we cleaned it up a whole bunch. And then I worked across the front one day and I did a video about it. I'm sure I shared that. And then later I did the end of the tank, which required me to remove the return plumbing apparatus up here. And now I'd have room and access. And I had to move things off that area to get to that sand. And then finally, while Dwayne was here, I did the entire back of the tank. And then the next step was to do inside this horseshoe and inside this horseshoe. So the rock actually does a horseshoe shape and there is a cave full of sand. And the center was the brownest of all, pretty much other than the back, the back was horrendous. But removing all of that, took out all the waste and allowed me to kind of clean up and have a nicer looking sand bed. The people that run a minimalist tank that just have a few rocks coming up, and I mean, it's literally, it's like no rock in their tank. It's just a skeleton to plant all their corals on and then they have all this exposed sand, probably can clean their sand bed much easier than I can. And that is, you know, I understand it, but that's also, you have to be more careful in that tank because there's so little biological filtration, you're really relying on everything that's working in the sump because you have no live rock in the tank. I mean, you literally have corals, a skeleton holding it up, and then let's call it an inch of sand or two inches of sand. And so you don't want to disturb that bacteria too heavily. So I would work on maybe doing a third of the sand bed per water change, or if you aren't even doing water changes, if you're just doing a third of the sand bed and then replacing just that water you used, it's better than working the entire sand bed that day. So I would just suggest always doing things in sections. Now, the smaller the tank, obviously, the more you have to decide what's best for you. I have a huge tank standing behind me that's seven feet long. So obviously I had big sections to work on. But if you're running with like a, an all-in-one 16 gallon tank, you might decide you're gonna do all the sand because you can see it all and it's just within reach of your hand and you're like, eh, I'm just gonna do it. You won't cause massive chaos. You will not cause a cycle by cleaning your sand bed, so don't fear that. So uh, something you do want to be observant for is when you are siphoning things out, <clears throat> you want to look and see what the water looks like, obviously. And if it's coming out brown, that's detritus. If it's coming out white, that might be your sand going down the tube, and you need to like pinch the hose to make the sand settle out of the tube, fall back down, and then reopen the tube to let water flow out. But we want to look as we're cleaning the sand bed, is there any areas that are black or sulfuric? And if you are selling, smelling sulfur, if you are seeing this black ooze coming out, that is a whole other problem, which I've actually never encountered. In all of my tanks in 25 years of being in this hobby, uh, yeah, it's 25 years as of 2022. Um, in all those years, I've never had black in my sand. Never. I've had rock sitting on top of the sand. I've had rock buried in the sand. And when I removed the rock, there was not like this black disgustingness that I've seen people post from time to time. It's never been a, a, it's never happened. So why does that happen to some people? I don't know. But if you do have these black pockets, that was an area that was super anoxic. It had no oxygen whatsoever. And it's death and decay. And when, as you penetrate it, as you expose it, and as you're pulling it out, it's gonna release all kinds of stuff into the water column. And it's, you know, even more so a time for a really big water change because you've, cracked open the disgustingness. And we need to remove that. You need to literally get all that out, even if you have to dispose of that batch of salt, you know, that, that area, just siphon out and let it just go, and then put in some fresh sand in that spot. You could do that. But uh, I've never encountered that with all the different tanks I've run. I had a 29 gallon with sand, the 55 gallon with sand, the 280 with sand, the 400 with sand, and then after 13 months it leaked. Had to break it down, put the sand in the 215. And then I set up that one for 18 months and I broke it down. I put sand back in this tank. And I, you know, just the cleaning we did last year, the five or six times I back in the sand bed, you know, aggressively to remove as much waste as possible. It, um, 
didn't come across any of that. And I think it avoided what someone might have labeled old tank syndrome because I had these huge colonies that didn't look healthy. And I kept saying it's got to be these ridiculous nitrates because any book you read about corals tells you nitrates need to be low. And it was the one number I could not seem to correct no matter what I did. So that's, that's all I have to say about sand. Uh, other things that could attribute to old tank syndrome uh, could literally be old age of your equipment where it's just time to replace things. For example, you buy a state-of-the-art LED light fixture and you know you buy it and they tell you it's gonna be good for five years, you know, 50,000 hours and you do the math and you're like, yep, that's fantastic. I'm so happy and you buy them, you hang them up and then you just leave them over the tank and you make sure they turn on and that's it. You ignore them otherwise and they get filthy within and the fans stop running. So it stops cooling itself properly. It gets clogged up. The lenses are getting really disgusting. And even the age of the light fixture itself, it's, it puts out less light than it did originally. You know, a brand new product works perfectly. A used one is gonna have lesser intensity the older it is. And uh, if you have had lights over your tank for four or five years, you've actually gotten your money's worth and it's time for some new lights. And if you just keep going and you're thinking, well, my tank just doesn't look right, might be the lights. It might be just that. And you never think that because the bulb didn't burn out. It still works, so it must be fine. LEDs last forever. Uh, I gotta tell you, I have bought a lot of LED lights over the last few years, not just for my tanks. I mean, for lighting in the house, lighting outside on the porch, uh, the pole light, Christmas lights, you know, you name it. And I love how they always say this lasts forever. And then I, after three months, the bulb outside fails. And then I have to go find the packaging, find the receipt, remember the store I bought it at, and show up and say, I need another one to replace it, even though it's supposed to guaranteed last for five years. But there's a hassle factor. You're like, eh, I'll just go buy a new one. And you just put a new one in. But are you really getting five years out of it? Only if you are doing what I just described. <laughs> and I only occasionally I'm able to do that. Usually it's like, eh, all right, whatever, I'll just get another one. And I'll be better about tracking it. And then I forget. And I don't save my receipt in a spot where I'll find it later. And it's a whole thing. I always say I should set up a spreadsheet and I should put in the date I bought it, where I bought it, you know, and then maybe scan in the receipt and keep it all in a folder. And that way I can just pull it up instantly and say, aha, you owe me this. But I don't do that. It's one more thing in my busy life that I just don't want to actually have to add to my day. But maybe I should do it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so your lighting could be a failure point. Your pumps could be a failure point, especially if they're dirty. And I know a lot of people don't like to clean their pumps as much as they should. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a thing, it's more work. But at the same time, as the pump gets clogged up, you have less flow in the tank, less flow in the tank. Corals aren't getting rinsed off properly. The tritus is building up within their core and you end up with having uh, you know, less growth and you're just thinking, I don't get it. And then you know, one day you say, let me take off this pump. Oh boy, that's really bad. And you're cleaning it and you're scrubbing it and you're starting to feel good about yourself that you're doing this really good thing for your tank. And you install it and you turn it on, you just see the skin blowing off your corals and you see the sand bed moving and you're just like, wow, look at all that flow, that's crazy. And you didn't even change the speed. It just is clean. <laughs> so stay on top of cleaning all your equipment. Make sure that your lights are being replaced in a timely fashion. Um, like I said, they aren't gonna be forever. And uh, then you have other things that could be decaying. Your return pump could be slowly going out. Your skimmer may not be skimming like it used to. Again, deep cleaning, thorough inspection, look for failure points, look for issues, look for things that are cracked or leaking or clogged up and make those corrections because if you're not running everything at peak efficiency, your tank will suffer gradually, just a little bit at a time. And over that period, you're just thinking, I don't know. So what else could you do that you have not thought about doing when it comes to cleaning your tank and you know, in, you've inspected all the gear and you're still having issues and you can't figure it out? Uh, one spot that would be worth looking at would be your overflow boxes and open them up, grab a flashlight and look down. Do they look clean in there? I bet they don't. So you wanna go ahead and you wanna vacuum all that out, brush it down, scrape the edges, maybe take the pipes out, look for any obstructions within, which could be anything. It could be snails, cucumbers, crabs, um, uh, pest anemones, um, hydroids, vermitids. I mean, all of these different things can cause some chaos where the water system is just draining down the pipe quietly. We wanna make sure those areas are very clean. Um, I mentioned this on reef bums 
uh, live stream, and I'll mention it on this one too. Uh, if you encounter a power outage in the next couple of months, you know, if it just happens, hopefully you'll remember this one thing I'm going to tell you because it's really important. If the power goes out, usually you do something to get power going within an hour, right? So like you hopefully have a generator, you can pull out and hook everything up and just get everything running. But if you don't do that, let's say you're a person that has battery backup air pumps that just turn on and put air bubbles in the tank itself. And the sump has no circulation, the reactors have no circulation, the overflow boxes are stagnant water. And then, you know, it takes them five, six hours to solve the problem. And then finally your power is restored. When it's restored, even though your tank was hanging in there, as everything comes to life and all that water commingles together, the water that sat in the overflow boxes could turn sour, basically. And that will drain down into your sump. And then your sump will mix it up and push it back up. And you're thinking, man, my tank just doesn't look right. I wonder what's going on. There was that power outage. I guess that's what caused it. I'm like, no, it was all the things that were stagnant. So if you are not keeping all water moving, then you need to do something proactively. So in the case of we're trying to save our tank, we're trying to keep it alive, we want to just keep the basics running. If you cannot run at least your return pump and some heaters, then you should run a pump in the display tank for flow. And uh, if you can't even run a heater, you know, let's just say you just don't have it. You have a little power inverter on your car, you run an extension cord inside, and you plugged in an air pump, and that's all you used. You can wrap your tank with blankets or with foam and tape it all, you know, kind of cocoon it to trap the temperature in there for the duration of the power outage. But you need to drain the overflow boxes and throw that water away. Any other reactors in your sump, bio pellet reactor, carbon reactor, uh, what else do you guys, uh, GFO, anything that just has water sitting in a cylinder, dump that water out, throw it away. And your protein skimmer is fine. That, that's, I've never heard of anyone having a problem with the water that sat in the body of a protein skimmer. But you can always take the skimmer out and just put it on the floor for now, and that way there's no water in it, right? And then if you can, you can put an air pump down in the sump as well, and you could even take a, you know, a pot out of the kitchen, scoop water out of the return zone, and put it in the skimmer zone to kind of make water move through it every once in a while, just to kind of move water through that compartments down there. That's when you're really struggling and you're just doing the best you can. Then when it's time to turn everything back on, when power is coming back, you would replace all that water you threw away. The water from the overflow boxes might be five gallons, 10 gallons of water, depending on the size of your tank. Could be less, obviously. Um, mine, it was five gallons each. And uh, then your reactors might have a few quarts. So you may need 10 or 15 gallons of brand new salt water to put in your system. So when you restart it, everything's nice and healthy. The reactors fill up with fresh water. There's no disasters. So please do keep that in mind because it's really easy to just forget about that. The best thing you can do is keep everything running with a generator. And that was what I'd recommend to you the most because that way everything's running. There's nothing stagnant anywhere. It's just not running at peak efficiency. You know, you're not running the lights because you don't need them during a power outage. Um, your tank will be fine without light for a day or two. Seriously, it will. If, um, but if your return pump is going and your circulation pumps are blowing and your reactors are still doing their thing and the skimmer's still doing its thing and the heaters are turning on and off, your tank will be fine. You know, you're just going to run it in emergency mode. And then after that, you know, you go back to normal and everything goes to full speed again. So that would be my recommendation with that. Um, basically, if you do all the things I just described, you know, stay on top of your stuff, keep everything clean, um, make sure that you clean your sand bed. Oh, blowing off the rock work. That's another big one. So... Depending on the size of your aquarium, there are different ways of doing it. If it's a small little tank, you can take a turkey baster and you just blow off the rock at all different angles and just make all that detritus kick out of the rock. And that stuff will get into the column and then it'll go into something. Protein skimmer, filter floss, filter sock, clarity, uh, just something. You know, even if it's a fishnet and you're just scooping it out. I mean, anything you can to get the detritus off the rock and off the corals is very important because the rock was porous in the first place. It's supposed to allow water to breathe through it and to be loaded with bacteria. And as the rock gets just impacted with waste, it will cause detrimental stuff to your tank. So we wanna make sure you stay on top of that. Now I mentioned turkey basters, but like in my tank, I wouldn't do that. It's too much work and I would never do that. So instead I would grab a maxi jet or some kind of power head. I'd plug in a really long extension cord, like the kind you use for a lamp. 
and I'll just walk around my tank and just blow everything off and just let everything kick up a storm. And the nice thing is, believe it or not, even all that waste, that detritus that you're thinking, ew, gross, odds are the polyps on your corals will eat it. So it's not a complete waste. It literally is being kicked up. It's in the water column. Your fish may snack on it. The corals will snack on it and the skim will pull it out and get it out of the system. But having nice, clean rock work in your tank, even on an older tank, is a very good step in the right direction. And then, of course, the absolute most important thing to avoid old tank syndrome would be to test your water. And every single week, I tell you guys, please test your water this week. And every single week, you say, uh-huh, but I don't know if you do it. <laughs> I know some of you do it. You'll even post your results. I'm really glad to see that. But if you are not testing your water every single week and things are going to crap gradually, and your corals are adapting to the crappy water. I mean, look at the ones that I grew. I grew big colonies that tolerated high nitrate. Now, if I tried to put something new in with high nitrate, it didn't go as well. If I, you know, if I uh, would solve it, everything just moves more smoothly. There's no, there's, you know, it, there's, it's not a crutch anymore. It's not like I'm trying to lift up one side of the tent to keep it okay. I know it's a terrible analogy. But, you know, we want to make sure that we are staying on top of everything. And water testing is so, so crucial. And then when you do test your water, another thing that comes up a lot, and I think that's, I mean, there's a few reasons why people get discouraged to test their water. Number one is no fun. It's just too much work. It takes too long. It's like no one told me I had to do this when I set up a tank. I, they just told me I could get this uh, swing arm hydrometer and mix up some salt and boom, I'd have fish, which is true. You can with fish only. But then you're at the store and like, ooh, these corals are really neat. What do I have to do to get those? Like, oh, it's really easy. You just put those in and they'll just grow if you have decent lights. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. But then you know, if you look at the posts, people were like, well, I got this. I can't remember what it's called. I don't really know what it needs. Should it be down low? Should it be in the shade? Is this non-photosynthetic? And you know, so we give them some advice and some uh, tutorials of what to do with said coral. But in the end, we need to know what's going on with our tank all the time. And I, rec I recommend weekly water testing always. And I've been doing it. You know, for the last couple of years, I've been really good. I'd, I think out of last year, I entered into Reef Trace, oh, I think it was 47 weekends out of 52. Pretty good. I mean, I really, at the beginning of the year, I was like, that's it. This year, I'm doing it every week for 52 weeks. I'm going to do it. And I didn't. <laughs> I tried, but I don't, I don't know what happened. But I was missing a few. I was like, dang it. But for the most part, I am really good about testing every Saturday or Sunday if I can't get it done on Saturday. And I go through and check things to find out where all the parameters are. Because if you keep all your parameters in check, your, your reef is going to be healthy. I don't see how you could do water testing every week and ever have old tank syndrome. Because you would start to see something going wrong. And you would start to work on correcting it. And you would catch the problem and resolve it. And if, you know, like, you know... If, you think my nitrate one would have been a really big, obvious one to me, honestly, and it's okay. I'm, I never said I was perfect. <laughs> I uh, just finally decided the simplest solution was going to be quit buying all these different products on the market and just really clean my sand bed, which I did, and boom, who knew my nitrates are now under control and it's nice and simple. And, you know, they're under 20. The last time I checked, they were 15. I just did two water changes this week, so maybe they'll be back down to 10 again. I'll find out. So that's it. Um, I hope that you found this helpful, informational, <coughs> and uh, I highly recommend that you analyze your husbandry skills, analyze your routines, and see what you can do to adapt to avoid old tank syndrome with your own aquarium. So let's answer some questions. Let's see, Brandon, it's not a question. He said, I watched you on the Reef Bum stream. Good to see you out there on some other channels. Yeah, I get out there from time to time. Sometimes people invite me. It's fun. And then Mike Campbell said that um, he enjoyed my guest appearance on there. And by the way, if you're looking for this one, uh, I can put a link in the description later. But for now, it's just youtube.com slash Reef Bum, and you'll find it. And by the way, he actually exports his live streams as podcasts. So if you're a podcaster and you just want to listen to it, you can. But then you won't see my really cool background that I had.
Uh, Kay says, would Vaseline help to keep the water out? I'm thinking you're talking about the wound. I don't want anything in my tank uh, extra, like deodorants from my armpit. You know, um, I don't want like band-aids on, you know, in the water. I don't want any lotions or oils, you know, none of that stuff. So I wouldn't put something on top. I mean, really, if your tank, if you're, if you have an injury and you uh, just want to wait till it's healed before you put your arm in the tank, or if you can use your other arm, I'm right-handed, so of course I'm using this one. But uh, sometimes I do things left-handed. Sometimes I put on a rubber glove that's tight so I can work in there if I have a nick on my hand. But it was just, let's avoid things. Uh, the thing that I think you get God, I'm probably wrong, but I think it's called Vibrio. And like I said, it's like in that flesh-eating disease category, and the bacteria in our water can get into your hands. And I remember when the fish vet was here to look at Spock, she actually recommended that I wear those thin gloves you wear all the way up to your shoulder, like they use for working on uh, livestock, like cattle. And I'm like, I haven't done that in 21 years, or whatever it was, whenever she was here, 20 years. I think starting now is kind of a little bit... It's a little bit late in the game for me. Plus, I, I just don't. I um, I have worn gloves in the reef. I don't do it every single time. Usually, if I'm going to wear gloves, it's because I'm working with two-part putty. And that's because as you knead the putty together in your hand, the stuff from the two parts can actually go into your palm and can affect you adversely. And someone who did a lot of frag demos, fragging demos, he uh, was mixing up putty, and he ended up being taken out with you know an, on a gurney uh, from a from an event, he had anaphylactic shock from working with a putty for like the thousandth time, and you know he'd been working with the stuff forever. So I'm really good about putting on rubber gloves to work the putty. Very rarely I do I do it barehanded. My friend Dwayne, who likes to plant corals in the tank, he doesn't wear gloves, <clears throat> but now I'm thinking about it. His method is he puts glue on his finger, <laughs> right on his fingertip, and then he rubs it on the rock, and then he puts glue on the coral, and you know smears it around and he puts it down on that spot he rubbed on the rock and he makes it hold on and if he was wearing the gloves and then put the glue on his fingertip he could just peel it off and he wouldn't be picking glue off his skin for the next half hour so if you're listening Dwayne that might be worth considering I don't know he he sells corals for a living he's got his hands in the water all the time but uh yeah it's uh I wouldn't want to use something like Vaseline <laughs> Sean says, at least you know when you've been diagnosed with old tank syndrome, you must have been doing something right to get to the old tank stage of reefing. Yeah. I just like that my tank right now is over eight years old, and I'm not looking at it thinking, oh, this doesn't have long to live. You know, I'm, it's actually really, really pretty, and I've really enjoyed seeing the new look of the reef uh, since all the work that happened last year. Uh, Alex says, I recently bought a condo on the fourth floor and I'm very nervous to move my 20-gallon mixed reef. I haven't stirred the two-inch sand bed in over two years. I have Nasarius nails. Okay, Alex, so in your situation, you if your tank has to be moved and it's over six months old, you definitely want to wash your sand bed. So you will take out a couple of cups of sand and put them in a Ziploc bag and put them somewhere in water where they keep the right temperature so they don't get cold. Because, you know, if you're moving this weather, wherever you're going to keep corals and fish, put the sand in there as well. We're just trying to keep that bacteria alive in the bag and then wash out those sand out. Just take, you know, go out there with a garden hose and put it in a bucket and swish it around and, you know, have the garden hose going full tilt and all the detritus will wash out and you'll have all this rinsed sand. Just drain out all the water. It doesn't have to be RO water. Everyone always says that. No, just tap water is fine and just get it rinsed so it's nice and clean and the water runs clear. And then you can just drain out all the water and you'll just have damp sand. Dump the damp sand in your clean aquarium. Add some uh, salt water to the tank and then take the bagged salt water that you saved and open it up and release it right at the sand bed. Don't pour it in the top and have it rain down. Just open it down low and let it make a little mound right there on somewhere, like a little hill of the brand use of the used sand on top of your clean sand. And that will repopulate the bacteria in there. That's it. Um, Manuel says that my outlets are blowing up bubbles again. Well, if you saw any, it's because I just did this water change. But other than that, I don't think we're going to have much of a problem there. The uh, water level in the sump is right at the right height. 
Everything looks good. And those nozzles need to be cleaned, by the way. See, I have something for me to do, too. Oh, good. I'm glad you figured that out. Um, we had talked, uh, he asked me a, a question on Messenger about his sump getting too much water in it, and it was the float valve. But the funny thing is, somehow he had a brand new extra float, or he had a float that was never installed. I don't know which. But uh, I'm glad that you hooked it up, and you've solved it, and now you're getting your salinity back up where it belongs. Okay, this is a good one. I should have mentioned this earlier. Uh, Bert says, I could be wrong, but the cause of old tank syndrome is trace elements. When we do a water change, we're only replacing 10, 20, 30% of the trace elements. Over time, this compounds, and you know, you'd have to do like a 90% water change to get all the trace elements in. Yes, uh, lacking anything in your tank that normally belongs would definitely be something I could see would lean into old tank syndrome. But okay, let's just pretend the salt mix you're using has everything in it like it's supposed to. Then, like you said, if you were to do a couple of really big water changes, and as long as everything matched, temperature, salinity, alkalinity, if those three are matching, everything else should take care of itself. You know, it should all just work out really, really well. If you're lacking stuff in the salt mix, like I did last uh, August, where I was missing some magnesium, I was missing some calcium, I was definitely missing a ton of potassium. That one was a, a big problem with a large water change. It actually made the tank suffer much more than had I done a normal size water change. So, and now I lesson learned, I check for potassium as well. <laughs> but uh, if you, I dose some elements, but not all of them. And now we've got this new thing where you can actually send in a water sample to measure the bacteria types in your aquarium, but it's still new technology. And I don't think we're getting enough information to know what to do with the results. You know, you, you spend the money, you send it off, and you get this chart, and it shows this is the dominant culture of bacteria, and here are some slivers of a few others you have. But I'm like, how do I get more of the greens? How do I get more of the purples? How do I get more of the blues, you know, the ones that were slivers, to make it where there's like 20% this, and 30%, and 50%, and 20%. And I mean, how, and how do we know which ones are the best ones to have? You know, how do we know which ones are the ones that are actually problematic and need to get out, or be the lesser? you know, so that it all equalizes because everything has a purpose on this planet. And so it's when there's too much of one thing, that's when we have problems and when there's not enough of something. So like you just said, if there's a lack of trace elements, that could be a thing. I've been dosing Prodibio every single, uh, well, twice a month for the last, you know, decade. And some of what I dose, I mean, there's Bioptim, BioDigest, there's um, Stronti Plus and there's IOD Plus, but there are other trace elements that I don't keep track of. And those, you know, like for example, iodine or um, strontium, molybdenum, um, and some others that we don't regularly test for ourselves. Usually it's really hard to test for. And so by sending off an ICP test, we can see how our numbers are doing. And if everything is within target range, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to think you don't have enough trace elements. But if you are lacking some, then you have to figure out where you can get those or what salt mix has them. So you can start doing some water changes to bring those up. But thank you for bringing that up, Bert. That was very helpful. Bob, I'm glad you got to see this live. Hello. Uh, Kay says, I pulled down my tank after eight years. I couldn't believe what I found. Well, I want to know what you found. I honestly thought it was clean, but no, it was bad. Plus, all the silicone was falling off. <laughs> yeah, that's a good reason to take the tank down. Good job. Um, the area under the rock work is an area that we can't really readily clean, especially if it's sand bed, because it could cause the rocks to tumble down. So that might be harder to clean under. If it's a bare bottom tank, odds are you have ways to like blow water that direction, move to try this out from under it. But I think really just blowing up all the rock work and under the rock work and the side and everything would be ideal and that we can vacuum out all the, the, the waste that you're finding everywhere. I just don't like the bottom of a bare bottom tank. And I definitely don't like seeing all the detritus gathering on the bottom. <laughs> ah, that's so hard. Jamie says, I'm about to do a tank move soon and the tank right now is the best it's ever looked. Wish me luck. Well, I wish you luck. Maybe because it's looking so good and it's so super healthy, it can handle what you're about to do.
Uh, Steve says, I use a plastic clamp with a screw, then zip tie the probe lead to that. Where he was talking about a different way of connecting things in your tank without using a magnetic holder. Sean said, I'm pretty sure Mark had the dead death zone on the back overflow side of the tank under the corals a few years ago. Scary stuff down there. Um, I didn't come across anything really vile. I um, removed all the corals from the coral graveyard that was full of life, by the way. It's the stupidest name. I call it the coral graveyard because corals fall down into that area, but they all grew and got bigger and bigger. And it, it became a solid mass of corals to where you couldn't even see the sand and I definitely couldn't clean it and I had no kind of circulation. And it was one of the things I tackled when Dwayne was here helping me was to get all those off the bottom, take out what I didn't want, save the best stuff and put it in the reef work, uh, in the rock work so the reef looked prettier and then vacuum that sand. And we did, we hit that spot probably twice and got a lot of, a lot of the brown detritus out. Let's see. Oh yeah, conks. Thank you, Bert. That's another one. Uh, another nice thing to have, and I had, I've not had one in years, is a couple of uh, sand conks. Uh, we used to get fighting conks, and you would get one per every two square feet. Sand conks, you could probably, I'd still do one per two square feet, but you could get like an extra one maybe, um, because they're smaller. The fighting conks are a little bit larger. They're about double the size of a sand conk. And then a cowries are another good one that work their way through the sand and work their way up the glass and clean. These are all, so, all fun parts of the cleanup crew. They're interesting to watch. And I could definitely use some. Oh, I ordered something new for my tank. So one of my friends, uh, Chad Vossen, he runs, man, I think it's called Vossen Aquatics or Voss, Vossen Aquaculture. Sorry if I got it wrong. But uh, he just put a post up on Facebook and he says, tell your friends and your club members and everybody, we have urchins. And he has homegrown tuxedo urchins. He makes them from nothing. Literally sperm and eggs. He rubs them together and boom, he has tiny little urchins and they grew. And I ordered five. And I was like, I got to have some of these Vossen urchins. I can't wait. I'll put some in this tank and I'll probably put one in the frag tank and let them just devour whatever they want to find. Or maybe I'll put all five in the big reef because they're so pretty. But I'm sure they're adorable size. I bet they're not like what we're used to getting. I'll probably be getting something about this size. And uh, they were $20 each, which isn't bad. And my overnight shipping was 30 bucks. So for 130 bucks, I got myself five tuxedo urchins that were grown in an aquarium. And I'm totally good with that. So if you wanted to get some, find Vossen Aquaculture or Vossen Aquatics on Facebook. <laughs> and he'll tell you if he has any left. But I know uh, another person on this channel, uh, Kevin, uh, who's also a club member, he uh, ordered some as well, so 10 are gone, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> Lucas says, hey Mila's Reef, I just tested my water. My alkalinity is 7.7, .7, calcium is 425, magnesium is 1450. Nitrates 13 and phosphate is 0, 0.00. Did you test your water this week? I tested my alkalinity three times this week. My uh, Trident tests calcium and magnesium, but I'm just kind of like watching the trends. I have not done my full battery of tests, but guess what? I have my stuff ready, all my goodies. So I can do that when I'm done with the live stream. So I am prepared to do it. Good job. Uh, Kay says, do you find that you see heaps of new stuff when you have to clean? You know, what's cool when you're doing cleaning your tank or you're looking down in the reef and you're discovering things that fell out of sight that are still alive and you can relocate them into a better spot. Uh, I remember years ago, I had a, a guy come over to my house. He took pictures of my tank. This was uh, probably the first person I ever knew that did professional reef tank photography. And he took these beautiful photographs of my stuff in my 29-gallon aquarium. And somehow from, at some point, he gave me, or maybe at a frag swap, I bought from him these little pink hammer corals. And, you know, hammer is, a, you know, it's a large LPS coral. He had these mini LPSs and they were pink and they were, the heads were small. Instead of being a large head, they were little guys the, uh, the size of a 
dandelion maybe? Slightly bigger than a zoanthid. <laughs> really pretty, very delicate looking and light pink. And I thought, man, that's awesome. And so I, I had this three headed frag that stuck on the bridge of my rock work. And then one day it came off and I didn't know, <clears throat> had no idea. And I was looking in my tank, you know, just doing stuff. And then uh, I noticed that the top perimeter of my Euro bracing was dirty. And so I cleaned the top with a sponge, but then you had to scrape the underneath where the, the water is always going against it. And I scraped off all this nuisance algae. And I'm looking through this crystal clear Euro bracing and I can see behind the rock work and I'm looking down and there's like, that's interesting. What's down there? And it was the pink hammer. And I was like, whoa, it's alive. I forgot about that coral. So I reached all the way down there, probably used tongs. And I got that coral out and I put it in the front of my tank, you know, like around here or somewhere. And it grew and grew and grew and grew until I had, oh, uh, I'd say, what size ball is that? <laughs> Not a volleyball. A volleyball is bigger, but one size down from a volleyball. And it was fantastic. And then when the 280 leaked, I mean, that was a perfectly shaped orb of all these heads. And then uh, when the 280 leaked, it was just dripping down this side, drip, drip, drip. We drained the tank of all the water and we took the corals out. And when I reached to take that colony out, I thought I would just like pluck out this volleyball of hammer. And uh, instead, actually, it was the size of one of those mini basketballs. There we go. And uh, so I took out this mini basketball coral, and I thought I'd just lift it out and put it in my trough to keep it alive. And it just shattered my fingers into all these pieces. And there was no way to like puzzle it back together in the perfect orb again. I was like, man. So anyway, they lived in the 215 while the tank was being repaired. Then when I got the tank back, it went over here. And I had some green hammer. I had some pink hammer. I had some frog spawn. And I had this big tiger cowrie, and it would knock stuff into the anemone every few months. And when it knocked the LPS in, the anemone stung it and murdered some heads. And I had, you know, I'd lose a few heads each time this happened. I'd put the coral back. I'd tell the cowrie, you're naughty, go over there to that end of the tank. And uh, I have no pink hammers left. I'm kind of sad because that was really neat, and I've not seen them since. But uh, if you know anyone, or if you see anyone out there that's selling it, send me a link. I'd love to get some new ones to put in my tank because they were a really nice contrast and they, they grew really nicely compared to, I don't know, hammers and frog spawns. They kind of just do their puffy thing. But that branching pink hammer just literally made a shape of its own. You know, it almost looked man-made when you think about it because it's such a perfect dome where other things just kind of spread out and have a lump here like broccoli, you know, when you compare it in, in looks. Anyway, it's really cool to find those types of corals lost in your reef. So do take the time to inspect and look down and look behind and, and look under and see if there's something you need to rescue and get back out into the open so it can grow into something beautiful one day. Um, Michael says, I have a rust-colored powder that forms on my glass and I have red turf and slime-like algae that grows on the rock. pH is 8.0 and phosphate is zero and nitrites are zero and I have a refugium. Well, um, I'm going to say that there's more parameters that we need to know. I mean, those are good numbers to know about. But if you've got several of those issues going on in your tank right now, you have phosphate, even though the test date's coming back zero. It's not measuring it properly because it's, it's there. I mean, if you've got algae growing, there's phosphate. And if there was zero phosphate in the tank, things wouldn't grow anyway. Nothing. So there is some in the system anyway, and so we can get false readings. If you were to do a deep cleaning on your tank, like scrape the glass and you know scoop up that, that uh, slime that's down on the sand and you were to siphon it out and then measured phosphates like 10 minutes later, I guarantee you they're not going to be 0.00. So um, you do have some phosphate in the tank. It sounds like you may need to treat for cyanobacteria, and which you can use ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX. Either of those products will get rid of that one problem, and it might kind of take care of the rust problem you're seeing on the glass. Maybe. Because, you know, when cyanobacteria happen, bacteria happens, yes, it makes like a blanket. It can be in different colors. It can be red, it can be green, it can be blue. Um, and it will do it on the sand, but you might have this skin on the glass too that could be reddish. 
it could be a different color. And then of course, if you're looking at reddish color under blue lighting, if your lights are in blue mode, it might look like rust. So if you could turn on the white lights or grab a white flashlight and really look at your tank, take a look and see what's on the glass and see if that's really rust colored or not. Um, of course, look for things that are rusting just in case. Um, check your GFO. If you're running GFO, check the reactor, make sure it's not pushing GFO fines through the return pump and blowing on the glass and sticking to the glass and creating rust. I mean, I don't know. You have to figure out exactly what you've got there, but manual cleaning would be the first step to actually use. I, what you can do is, you know, this is a trick I did a long time ago. When I had something on the glass that I wanted to remove, but I didn't want to get blown around everywhere, I turned off all the flow in the tank, and then I would take a credit card or a scraper, and I would scrape down the glass really slowly, and there's no flow in the tank, right? And all the stuff coming off would just rain down and sit on the sand. And I'll keep doing that, doing my best not to disturb what rained down. I want all that crap at the bottom right against the glass. And then I'll take my scraper or a credit card and I'll push it all together into a little mound. And then I would take my, you know, flexible uh, tubing, some kind of vinyl hose, and I would siphon out that pile of waste to eliminate it from the system and then replace whatever water you used up to replenish it. But that was so I would not just send it loose to land somewhere else or sit behind the rock work or go somewhere. And um, if you have a lot of slime on the bottom of your tank anyway, you want to siphon out as much of that first before you treat. So that way you do not uh, have too much of it die all at the same time in the system. Um, there's very rare occasions where someone will say, okay, I give up. I'm going to, you know, kill the cyano and their tank is probably like wall-to-wall -wall cyanobacteria. It's just, it's really bad. And they put in the medicine and everything dies and the water literally turns pink or red. I've never seen that happen. It, like I said, it's happened to like three people that I personally know in 20 years. So I'm going to, and I just, you know, I'd say, did you remove any first? And you know, usually the answer is no. So I think when you have that much of something in your tank and you try to kill it, it's a big, domino effect uh, because it's all dying simultaneously. So I'd much rather remove as much as I can and then go ahead and treat the tank for the little bit that's left. Just like if there's green hair algae, I like to rip out as much as I can and then I put in the cleanup crew to get the last of it rather than get a big old cleanup crew and tell them eat it all because that's being very ambitious and very hopeful and very unrealistic because typically their little bellies just can't eat as much as you're hoping. Only certain things can consume vast amounts of hair algae and that would be like the uh, the sea hare, those things, they just mow it down. I mean, they are just eating machines, but because they eat it so quickly, they eat it all to where it's gone, and the sea hare can die in your tank because there's no more food left. So you need to get it out of your tank and back to the fish store or to another hobbyist who has hair algae and keep the guy going. Our club had one that we shared, and his name was Rerun. <laughs> I love that name for that sea hare. It was so good. Ah, oh, Steve, thank you. That's another thing you can do. Um, earlier I mentioned how your lighting could be getting old and uh, it's not as efficient or it's not as uh, proficient in providing adequate power to your tank. So you can actually replace the LED pucks. And Steve says he does that. Um, Dwayne was doing that. He bought those Chinese black boxes that have like a million little LEDs in them. And he had like, I don't know, six or eight of them over his tank. And every year he would take one down take everything, every LED out, put brand new ones in, put that one in and take the next one down. And he would just go through until he replaced every LED and all the light fixtures. And um, he liked to run those lights at 100% on all channels all year long. And then once a year, he had to completely dis dissect them and rebuild them. And he did it for a long time and I kept saying, you're crazy. <laughs> I mean, he saved a lot of money doing it, but ugh, I don't wanna do that. And I do not wanna do eight of them so he ended up, because he sells so many corals to fish stores, he got some store credit and he got himself some radions. And he probably got some used radions from someone too, probably. And he really liked those. And then he got the sky. And I guarantee you, he's not gonna rip out all of his uh, LEDs out of his sky in a year and swap them all out with new ones. I, I know he won't. But he's probably running those skies at 100% too. <laughs> or I run mine at 60%.
Oh, that's great. Kay says, we just got a generator switch put on the power box for blackouts. Best 150 bucks I ever spent. I can run the whole house in a blackout now. Wow, that's really nice. I don't even have that. I would love that. I just have a real life generator. You know, the thing, everything has gone up in price. Uh, can I complain for a minute? <laughs> I, um, I've been working on my new building because, you know, I'm feeling a little bit better now. So I, I'm slinging two by fours, right? And I put up the wall that will be the front of the room where all the products are going to go. And the top needs a bunch of joists going across and then decking on top of that so I can have attic space to store things um, just to save space inside the building. And, you know, I mean, certain things don't need to be within reach. You know, they can be up high. And so I went to Home Depot to buy two by fours. And I needed, I need two by fours that are 72, 79 inches long. Okay, so an eight foot two by four would be fine. Uh, a 92 and five eighths would be fine too. I'm just gonna have to cut off the end. It's just, I'm gonna have some waste. That's okay, because the room is six feet front to back. Um, all the two by fours in Home Depot, whether they were yellow wood or white wood, um, 92 and 5 eighths or 96 inches, they were all $6.60 a piece. And I needed a dozen. So I know prices went up, but then they went down <laughs> and now they're up again. So I wish I'd bought these two by fours, I don't know, a month ago because they were $4 each and now they're six sixty dollars a piece. It's just so expensive. And then I had to get plywood for the decking for the for the attic space right and i'm walking down the aisle and each price tag just shocks me as i go and i i know they're up but oh my god they're up so i looked at birch of course you know why not if you're gonna spend that kind of money you might as well get a good sheet of plywood um i looked at the chipboard i looked at mdf i don't want an mdf because it gets wet it rots um and it swells and it collapses but uh i ended up getting three sheets of something that was probably half inch thick for some reason they put everything in like 13 64ths i'm like really can't you just i mean i know why that happened that's because of people in california someone sued home depot saying that their three quarter inch piece of plywood was not three quarter inch thick <laughs> i'm like oh so i'm over there trying to convert numbers to get an estimate to what size is this wood's thickness anyway i came home with three sheets of wood 12 two by fours and some little metal brackets and it was two hundred and sixty dollars <laughs> i'm like okay i mean you know i need this i just I hate paying for it okay i'm done i'm done complaining that was it let's see Polo asks the question, any recommendations or tips for someone who's planning to switch salts? Switching from Red Sea Coral Pro to Tropic Marin Pro F, <laughs> Pro Reef. <clears throat> um, nothing really major that you have to do. I mean, obviously, okay, I'm not gonna say obviously, I'm sorry, let me take that back. I always recommend anytime you open a brand new barrel of any kind of salt, barrel, bucket, box, bag, anything that's brand new, never been opened, cut it open, mix up a batch, even if it's just a few gallons, and measure everything you can measure. Measure alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, measure potassium, measure salinity, temperature. You know, find out everything you can about it. Then you'll, you can assume everything in that bag will be the same. And that way, if it's kind of a larger bag, like for example, Fritz, they have a box. I think it's a 200 gallon box and you, it's a bag inside the box. You open the bag, you do your, you mix up some water and you measure it, you know everything. I would then think, for the next couple of times I mix up salt water, it's gonna be the same as the first test. That would be my hope. Uh, that's assuming everything's mixed properly. And that generally is the case. So if you are used to using Red Sea Pro Reef and you've measured it and you're used to its numbers, when you get your Tropic Marin, mix it up and measure it. Now I believe Tropic Marin may run a lower alkalinity than Red Sea Pro Reef. And then the other thing is, is that when you're doing your water changes, one of the things I always heard people do they say when I switch flavors of salt, I would then do small water changes to kind of sneak up on the tank, you know, kind of rather than just like, boom, here's 25% of a different salt. 
I don't know that that is necessarily a necessity, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing a couple of smaller water changes with the new salt and watch your livestock to see how it, uh, how it handles the change. But I would emphasize the importance of measuring your salt mix to know what the parameters are before you put in the tank. Because let's say you like to run your tank at alkaline of 9.1. Okay, let's say that's your magic number and your calcium is 450 and your magnesium is 1320. Let's say those are the numbers you have. And you mix up your Tropic Marin and it comes in at 7.7 .7, and your calcium comes in at like 425, which seems doable and magnesium is like 1400. Let's just say those are the numbers. Then you know with your water change, you're putting in more magnesium than what you took out. And you know that you're putting in lower alkalinity than you normally have. So your alkalinity and your pH are gonna drop after the water change a little bit because you changed a portion of all the water. Whether it's a 10% water change or 25% water change, it will change. So in the case of the lower alkalinity, if you like 9.2 and you're buying salt mix that always measures 7.1, you're gonna always have to buffer it up to get the alkalinity to match your tank, or you're gonna to have to gradually bring your tank down to that alkalinity. It's, that's a choice you have to make. I was talking with someone, oh, Reef Bum, and he was saying how he uses Instant Ocean. He's been using it forever, and he measures what the tank, I mean, what the salt mixes, and he adds supplements to whatever he needs to make his reef happy and keeps his, his corals growing. So no matter what brand of salt you use, you wanna make sure that the numbers it's providing are close to what you need or you need to improve the batch of salt water to match your tank. So as you make your changes, there's no notable change to the livestock. The fish and the corals just won't notice the difference. Odile says, to get glue off your hands, use nail polish remover, then wash your hands. You know what I do? I take a super long shower because <laughs> I love hot water in my back because my back's always hurting. And I just sit there and I just peel and peel and peel until my fingers are clean. Uh, Davy says, are you going to, or Davy says, are you going to get another purple tang? I don't think I will. I don't know what I'm getting yet, but I will get another one. Gulf Coast Reefer says, how could I make a single drain pipe be quiet? Uh, there's a trick that uh, we did back in the day. I did it myself in my tanks. So... Your drain pipe that's going down to your sump, does it have a Durso on it right now? I mean, that's usually one technique. Um, if it's just a pipe coming up, uh, some, like with mine, I had a pipe come up and I put an elbow on the side so water would just go in the elbow and drain down. And then I drilled a hole in the top of the elbow and I took some airline tubing and I snaked it into the hole and went into the pipe about that far. You just literally push the tubing in and it, the hole has to be the same size as the tubing because you don't want to let go of the tubing, shoop, it goes down to your drain, right? You want it to hold on to, so you got to do a little bit of uh, figuring here to make sure everything's correct, but hole size and tubing size should be the same diameter. So when you put the tubing in, it stays in position. And then you would push the tubing in until it gets quiet. And if it's, you know, if you go too far, it doesn't get quiet. If you don't put it enough, it doesn't get quiet. But you find that sweet spot and then you could put a few drops of glue on it or something to kind of keep it locked in that place or maybe slide an O-ring down it to hug the tubing. And that's how I did mine. And it made my 29 gallon reef really quiet as it was draining through the external overflow box. I just had a little piece of airline tubing go down the drain pipe. Uh, there's other things you can do. I mentioned Durso. There was another one called Herbie. And um, so there's a few. And I'm sure if you type in quiet drain pipe, saltwater aquarium in Google, you'll get all kinds of great suggestions. Uh, Delta says, regarding the power supply for your Vortec, I just want to look. I want to Let's do an unboxing. Brand new. Ooh, it's got that new Vortex smell. All right, here's the power brick. So this one, wow. Wow. Maybe I can't do what I was hoping. Maybe I have to install my brand new pump. This one says it's 32 volt output, 
1.875 amps. So they've changed the power supply for this pump, which is an MP40. Here's the new pump. Pull it over here so you can see it. And, uh, hmm. So I'm retiring that old Vortec, apparently, and just using this one. The other thing I'm going to have to do when I install this Vortec pump on my tank, uh, one of the things I want to do, I want to make the acrylic bracket that goes around it to keep it in place, uh, like I did for the MP60s. And I'm going to have to figure out how to make this not work with Mobius and work with WMX for my Apex. Because when I hit the button on my uh, feed, when I, you know, when I want to feed the tank, I hit a feed button. And when I press that button in, it turns off the return pump, it turns off the skimmer, and it slows the MP40 down so that it's less uh, dramatic in that tank. And uh, I can't do that if it's tied into Mobius. So I need it to be uh, only talking to the WMX. So I'll have to look it up and see how people did that. I'm sure it's something to do with firmware and, and uh, I don't know what else, but I got to do something. So I'll have to figure it out. But uh, thank you for bringing that up, Delta. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. Um, you know, I'm going to put on the screen again. So he said, uh, the amps really don't matter as long as there's a, the least amount, at least enough to meet the needs of your load. Um, like I said, mine said 24 volt. And I had lots of other power supplies. And the sad thing is, all these extra power supplies I had, as I plugged them into the wall, some had a green light that came on, and some just didn't come on at all. It's like, really? They just literally died sitting on the shelf? It's weird. I have a hard time believing they're really broken. Because <laughs> they were working until the moment I unplugged them. Then they just suddenly just rot away. It makes no sense. Uh, Lee and Mandy say, would you recommend cleaning the sand bed on your older tank or even on a newer one, or would you let your cleanup crew take care of it? Well, I've always let the cleanup crew take care of it. They do the day-to-day -day cleaning all the time. But like I was saying earlier in the stream, I would recommend, if you're going, if you're going to just let your tank, your, your sand bed be, and let your tank just mature gradually, I wouldn't be touching the sand bed much. And occasionally, I would clean a section of it and work my way around the tank. So, um, I, rather, I mean, for example, the fish store by me, Frank would clean his sand bed two, three times a week. And he was constantly vacuuming and leaving those little mounds of sand. It was kind of a ripply look because he did so many water changes on his tanks. And that's what he did. He didn't dose anything in his tanks. He just changed tons and tons of salt water. And that was his routine. And his sand always looked perfect in all the tanks because he was constantly vacuuming them. They always were pristine. Well, it's kind of an expensive way to keep your sand clean, to be honest. But um, now he's not doing it as much. And I'd, I don't know. I'd have to ask him. But uh, I, I do know that if you vacuum your sand bed all the time, it'll always look clean. But then if you only want to vacuum it occasionally, like, let's just, how do I explain this? If you vacuum it all the time, the sand always looks clean. If you vacuum it sporadically, your sand bed never looks right. It's like it gets messed up because you're, you've got this, um, you remove some detritus, you disturb the bacteria, and the sand bed just looks dirty. It never looks clean. So I would say that you either commit to one or the other. And, but to clean it once in a blue moon will not mess up your sand bed. I know that for a fact. So you don't have to worry about that. If you were to go through your tank and clean the sand bed with a lot of vacuuming, and then you start to see a little bit of brown stuff on the surface of the sand, which looks a little bit like diatoms and so forth. You can use some Microbacter 7, and you can dose that for a few days, and that will actually make the brown stuff just kind of magically go away, which is pretty nice. But the general rule is you do it once in a blue moon, or you do it all the time, and you have to pick which is your preference. Um, <laughs> more tank, more problems, says. <laughs> We're moving soon, and I'm planning for an upgrade. 450 gallons. Oh, okay, so you want to up, go one up on me, huh? I only have a 400, so you want a 450. I see what's happening here. What are your thoughts on in-wall tanks that have a 3D background or live rock walls and their longevity? Uh, one of the coolest things I ever saw 
was something a guy did where he made a shadow box behind the aquarium. And what he did, it was very narrow, like four inches thick. And he put it, you know, like in the wall behind the tank. And then the back of his tank was crystal clear. And the shadow box, he had some kind of an obscured or, or scuffed up surface so that it was opaque. And then he took twigs, branches that kind of looked like coral skeletons. And he had, I, I think, well, who knows? It was so long ago. It might have been T5 bulbs. But he had some kind of, like, I'm going to assume LED lights, <laughs> uh, some kind of lighting that would glow up from below. And it just kind of gave you this really cool, uh, you know, like it was brighter here, and then it, it faded off to darker as it got to the top of the tank. And you could see the shadow of the branches through the uh, obscured glass. And that made the tank look deeper. It made it look like the tank went off into the ocean. It was really, really neat. And others have done really interesting painting techniques where these different shades of blue. So they have a, like a bright blue, then a darker blue, then a really deep blue, and then navy blue, and then blue black, and then black. And they would just do like a, the bright blue, and then it just kind of rainbowed out. And it was, again, that effect of distance. And it came out really, really nice. It all comes down to artistic stuff. For me, I mean, <laughs> when I was a kid, what you did was you went to the fish store and you bought a background that you taped to the back of the tank. And it usually looked like a reef or, or like some kind of saltwater underwater area. And uh, sometimes it was just like purple foil, you know. <laughs> it was just something so you didn't see the wires and the pumps hanging on the back of your aquarium just to obscure it. My favorite is to have a black background on a tank and to keep the back clean all the time so that everything just stands out and pops in color against that black background. I mean, right now my tank is clear because it's peninsula style. But if I had a black background, all these corals, their profiles would be fantastic because there's not a bunch of pink and purple coralline behind the corals. So um, I would put a background on the tank that looks nice, but isn't so distracting that you miss the point of the reef, if that makes sense. I hope that helps. Uh-oh. Okay, so I'm going to read all this. Dobby says, I upgraded from a 75-gallon to 180-gallon, and I wish I knew about this channel before I did that, but I used my old sand and all my old rock when I transferred everything to the new tank. It's been running for four months now, and I'm going through the ugly stage. Following your advice, I've been testing my water weekly. I have five tangs now and would like to add at least two more. For 180, you might be maxed out when it comes to tangs. How would you do that? Do you think there would be a lot of aggression if I had two or three at the same time? I currently have a sailfin, a purple, an Atlantic blue, a blonde nassau, and a hippo. Well, I think you're maxed out on tangs, and I think that Atlantic blue is going to become a really big, aggressive bully and attack all the other tangs. I, um, if anything, I would remove one. Uh, it's 180. It's not a giant tank. Uh, this, like I said, this tank is, and you know, 186 feet long. Mine is seven feet long. It's three feet wide, and I had five tangs in there before. Now I just have. Three. I have the Nasso, the yellow, and the coal. I'd like to add one more again, but I don't know what. I uh, don't want to do a hippo tang because they tend to chew on your zoanthids, and I don't like that. But uh, I would not put any more tangs in your 180. I think it's, I mean, do you have any rock in that tank? Is it just a big box of water where there's all the swimming space? But still, the aggression level, you mentioned aggression, and the Atlantic blue is an aggressive tang. So it would be really hard to find. I mean, it's going to be hard for the ones you have now to get along long term and to add more to the mix. I don't know if that's a good plan. What? Brian Max says, I have a one of them has three eyes. I've never seen that before. That's amazing. You need to send me a picture. It sounds like something out of Futurama. Melanie, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate it. That's going to turn into a cup of coffee for sure. Let's see. I'm looking for the next question in case you're wondering why it's so quiet. I 
Alex G says, I'm mixing up a gallon of magnesium. I have a feeling I'll be, I need to dose two gallons to bump up from 1290 to 1350 PPM. Um, what size tank? Oh, that's kind of neat. Kay says, I like to feed my urchin whenever he's up high on the glass. After six months, I think he's learned to come to the top when he's hungry. <laughs> uh, Emmanuel says, good catch you on the live stream. How are you managing your potassium right now? Are you daily dosing? No, I stopped dosing about, feels like about a month ago. And because the tank was at 460 and the last test was 435. So we'll see what the test is today. But I have a three quarters of a bottle ready to go for if I need to fire up the dosing pump again. But for now, I don't wanna keep pushing it up. I just wanna keep the right amount in my tank, which is between 400 and 450. Oh, neat. Luca says, I think I have the pink hammer like, like that. I'd give you a frag when it's ready. But I live in Croatia. Dang it. <laughs> send me a picture on Instagram so I can check it out and then I'll find an old picture of mine and send you a picture of it let's see some talk about pipe organ I've never kept one of those I've seen the skeleton many times but I've never grown one Moondog says that they are having an Aptasia attack. It's never happened before and it's taken over my tank. Please, please help. F Aptasia is the cure that everyone recommends and I sell it in my shop and it works and it kills the Aptasia completely. It actually blankets it completely with like a hard crust. And after three days, you can just break the crust away and there'll be no Aptasia there and everything underneath, whatever was there is dead. So, um, that would be what I'd recommend for your situation. Don't let it land on something you care about. Hey, Eric. Eric is with us from his hospital room, I bet. He's fighting cancer and just got himself some new kidneys. And he worked out a deal with his wife for everything they took out of him, you know, for each item they pulled out of his body, he gets a new thing to put in his reef tank. <laughs> I had to share that. He posted that in Club Neal's Reef, so it's not a secret. It's really funny. I told him to get five of those urchins. <laughs> wow. Alex, what size tank is this? Is this that 450 or is it something else? I got you mixed up with someone else, I guess. He says he's about to need 27 sheets of plywood in the near future for a stand top and tank bottom. Holy crap, that's a lot of lumber. I mean, talk about flaunting your wealth. <laughs> you drive away from Home Depot with 27 sheets of plywood, someone's gonna think you're really rich. And technically, you're very poor. <laughs> but someone might steal your plywood, that's crazy. Man. Wow. Steve says the price of lumber in the UK doubled as well. Oh, that's interesting. Ah. This world is so difficult, right? <laughs> nice. Daryl, you just reminded me I need to feed my tangos in Benarif. He says, I just want to say thanks for recommending Benarif. I haven't had to clean the glass in but one in two weeks, and even then it wasn't that bad. Corals are happy too. And you see, I clean my glass every single day. I need to start dumping in Benner Reef. I just gotta get back on track with that. Let's see. There's a lot of conversation in the chat. Sorry, take me a second to find the questions. <laughs> Sean says, can I buy that open box MP40? 
no, I bought that for me, for my tank, for my new cube. So you guys know I ordered a new tank from Planet, and it's here. And the next step is going to be to replace the tile that the tank is on. This is going to be my new tile. So this, I think, I think is seven inches wide and 42 inches long or something like that. I don't know, but uh, it's made to look like lumber, very heavy, very thick, and it's going to replace all the tile from the front door to the back door and the entire kitchen and under the anemone cube. So this has been ordered and I was told there's, I guess a box has 56 pieces and there's 56 different looks. So it won't look like a standard pattern. It'll look varied and you know, they just change it all up to make it look pretty. So anyway, this is happening very soon. And so when they come to do that, I am going to take the anemone cube down. They are going to put the tile in, then they are going to come back and grout it. And then I don't know, seal it or I'll have to seal it or something like that. And then after it's dry for I don't know, a couple of days, I got to put a new stand in that spot and put the new tank on top and put the livestock into it. So what I'm going to do, I've given this a lot of thought. I'm going to go ahead and I've got this tank that I built a few years ago that's been sitting in the back room, never had a drop of water in it. It was for a test that I never got around to. I'm going to use that to put all the livestock from the enemy cube in. And I'm going to put it in the fish room because it's not huge. It's just kind of, I don't know. It's, it's narrowish and long, and I'll just hook up, I'll put it on top of something, I'll make a, a quick impromptu stand, and I will put that tank on there, and I will put a return pump in the sump, they'll push water into that tank, and then the water drain back into the sump. And I will, that way it still gets the heating, it gets the calcium reactor, I'll have to rig the light over it, I guess, so the enemies don't go crazy and just wander off into Timbuktu. And then, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some changes because there'll be changes. And I'll take my Vortec and I'll put it on the side of the tank, and it'll blow water through the tank, and then, the new tank will go up and uh, the livestock will be moved in. It'll still be all the same water the whole time. So that'll be exciting. I have some ideas on the new plumbing. One of the things I like about the new tank is that it will have two drains instead of one. I've had one drain, a one inch drain on that tank for the last eight years. And a few times last year, and only last year, a few times last year that tank overflowed. and. I mean, it just sounded like Niagara Falls in my kitchen. It was insane. And, and the crazy part is, is I'm looking at the tank and the water's just pouring down sheets of water, rolling down the walls of this rimless tank. I could see all the lit up electrical underneath and nothing was shorting out. And I had to reach through to hit the off button. It was crazy. And then throw down towels. And of course, Jack is like, are you okay? And I'm, you know, freaking out. So, and the problem was that the single drain would get clogged with an anemone that went into the overflow box. So having two drains on the new tank will eliminate the problem because I can set one to be quiet for a quiet drain into the sump and the second will be the emergency drain and it should be noisy. So if something clogs up, I should be able to catch it and I'll keep an eye on the drains of, as well to make sure that like, the overflow box is different this time. I don't think anemones will be able to get into it. It's the tide line from Planet. It's very narrow. It's got little ovals. I just don't see them getting in there, but of course I'm gonna stick my head up there and look down from time to time. But it'll be really nice to have two drains instead of one on the new tank and it not be rimless ever again. It'll be so nice to not have that. I, I'm very happy with that. And then I'll have woodwork on the top so that way I don't get blinded by radiant light anymore. I'll have a nice stand that matches underneath. And then once that's completed and looks good and I'm happy with it, I'll continue the woodwork to wrap this reef tank as well. So. Rick says, how is the algae scrubber working? Perfectly, week after week. I cleaned it out um, about four days ago, I think, whatever I put on Instagram. And uh, I took that screen down to almost nothing. And I was like, I probably overcleaned it this time. And then I opened the drawer a couple days later and there was green algae. I was like, yes, it's still going. So yeah, it's working out really, really well. I don't think you want the Vortec I'm retiring. <laughs> 
I don't know. Uh, actually, I have retired MP60s. I have retired MP40s. But maybe you can. I mean, maybe they are good. I don't know. I mean, they got the drivers. They got the, the chips. They've got, you know, whatever. But I was just ready for brand new motors on my tanks. You know, 2022, everything new, right? That should be a, a saying or something. Thank you, Reefkeeper. Long press on MP40 under devices in Mobius and select downgrade firmware. Then it'll work with a WXM. Thank you so much. I might just screen save that so I can find this later. Uh, Emmanuel says, I gave up on the MP40, or I'm sorry, I gave up on the Ecotech Vortex. I went with the Nero's instead. The MP40 started being very loud after four months of use. That's weird. Seems like they have bad bearings on the dry side or something. Uh, the th I like the Nero pumps. They're relatively easy to clean. I just cleaned the one on my frag tank uh, two nights ago. And the only thing I don't like about them is there's zero way to battery backup them. The only thing I can do is literally plug it into a UPS and let that be the battery backup. But that would be very limited how long it'll last because it had to convert the power from the UPS to the AC that switches it to DC to feed the pump. If I could battery backup into a Nero 5 just so it just runs at DC the whole time, the battery backup would last forever. It'd be fantastic. Rasmus says, Spock is searching for the invisible banana you put in. I don't have any bananas right now. She's struggling. I'll have to give her some nori instead. I have to get some new ones. I had some on the counter and they spoiled and I threw them away. Uh, Kay was saying you could silicone the actual pump into place. Yeah, but I had this crazy idea of these little acrylic brackets that uh, hold the, the motor. It just looks nice, but you're right. I mean, technically, you could basically silicone the motor to the side of your, your glass tank, and it would probably stay there pretty well. Um, I don't know if it would... Does it hold without the cord being tethered to the tank as well? You know how because there's a wire coming up, and we're supposed to put the sticky pad... And my problem is those sticky pads never last long enough. They just let go, and you have to re refix them or swap them out with a new one. And so because of trust issues <laughs> and knowing those things don't hold forever, I made this mount, and I put it on both my MP60s, and I just looked at them yesterday, actually, because I was curious. They've been on there now for a couple of months, and they look perfect. They didn't start to come off the tank at all. And if I take the wet side off to clean the, uh, to clean the motor, the inside, the wet side, the motor on the outside will stay put. It'll just sit in the little uh, cradle I built. And that way, when I put the, the wet side back in, they come back together again. So I want to do the same thing for the uh, new anemone cube. Mike says, I'm finally setting up or getting our 110 gallons set up with a DIY sump. I think you recommended one inch spacing between the baffles and one inch off the floor over under over flow path. Okay, so what you want between the baffles themselves, you want one inch space between them. Don't do a, a don't put a mark and then a mark at one inch and a mark at one inch because you'll end up being like three quarters of an inch between baffles. You want one inch of space between them. I actually put a, you know, when I'm doing that kind of stuff, I will put a one inch wide um, jig between my baffles so that they are literally exactly the right width. And then the, the middle baffle, so it's gonna be over, under, over. The middle baffle's up one and a half off the bottom of the sump. If you wanna put heaters between the baffles, if you can squeeze them into the sump, if they're not too crazy long, then you might want it to be two inches between the first two baffles so that way you can slip the heaters down in there, like in a heater holder, like the one I sell. And then you have the water flow over the baffle, through the heaters, under, and over into the next zone. Marcus, I'm doing my best to ignore that. Ah! Dobby, okay, so thank you for the super chat. And he said, I meant 75 gallons to a 280 gallon tank. That's a big difference. So yeah, five tangs, six, seven tangs, and a 280, it's doable. 
it is doable. But I still think the Atlantic blue is a problem. Uh, you probably got a juvenile, right? Something small and yellow right now that's going to turn blue. But they really do get mean. And so you may run into problems combining them. You guys quit talking about fresh water on my channel. <laughs> So funny. Uh, Red Dawn, I don't know what you're asking. I'm using Polyp Labs 1. Do you think the acetate that produces CO2 should be good for my refugium? What are we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, if you are still here, can you explain what that was in reference to something I'm sure I said and has since have since forgotten about? Wow. Wow. Okay, so Alex G definitely has a huge tank. 2,100 gallons. Whew. That's big. Alex asks, do angels eat pineapple sponges? Ah, uh, they can. I mean, angels eat sponge. It's possible they could. Um, but uh, not guaranteed. But they do like sponge, and they like sponge in their diet. So there are angel-specific foods you can buy in the frozen section that have sponge in the actual food mix. Thank you, Raul. He uh, also downgraded, downgraded his to from Mobius with an MP10. Thank you very much. It says it's well documented on Ecotech. <laughs> Sean, you don't want my used pumps. I run them for eight years. I mean, come on. It's not like it's something new. Things been through a lot. I mean, there's a reason I'm replacing it. Uh, Hawkins says, I hope it won't ship easily. Uh, it shouldn't. It should be very durable. I mean, think about it. I have ceramic tile in my whole kitchen, and I have dropped all kinds of stuff on that ceramic tile uh, over the years because I built so many sumps in this house, and in invariably, I would drop things like weights. <laughs> like, you know, weights. And I would drop, and you're like, chip. I'm like, oh my god, I just chipped my tile again. So this stuff is porcelain. It's even stronger than ceramic, and they're going to do a great job installing it. And I can't wait to see the new look. I'm very excited about this because I have tile where you first walk in the door and then it's a hallway with carpet. I'm standing on carpet. And then there's tile that goes toward the patio doors and into the kitchen where the anemone cube is and the utility room. And instead, this time, I thought, what if I just run the tile all the way to the back in one run? So as I'm taking things out of the fish room that drip like skimmers, and take them into the kitchen, I can drip on tile and not risk dripping on carpet. And the other thing I can do is I can walk in from outside when it's raining and I can walk all the way to the back and not get any moisture on the carpet. So I like that idea. Or coming in from the back door or going from the back door to the front door. Like if I'm working in the new studio and I pack up the orders and it's raining and I have to come in to go through the house to get to the truck to take it to FedEx, I will be able to do that, and I will be on tile the whole way. So I think it'll look really nice. I'm actually excited about the whole new look. And it's supposed to happen pretty soon. Eric says, are you going to upgrade to a sky over the anemone cube? I don't think so. I could, because I have three in stock. <laughs> um, I don't need to. So, I mean, I like the look of the cube with what I've got right now, which is the radon with the XHOs. Uh, but I could. I just haven't had a need. But it, it was a thought. It crossed my mind. Alex, uh, you said he said that he sent me an email about the radiant heating. Yes, I got it, and I left it marked unread so I wouldn't lose that in my inbox. Thank you very much for that. I actually want to really look at that and kind of see if I understand it. And I'll get back to you if I have more questions. <laughs> you guys. Kay wants my eight-year-old hand-me-downs.
Lincoln says, do you know how or why corals, especially zoanthids, have so many different colors? Are they random in the wild or are they lab created? They are really coming from the ocean that way. Uh, it's interesting that there are so many morphs. I mean, seriously, there are a lot of different looks and it seems like no matter what you find, there's always another one out there that's even better. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind, zoanthids are very small, usually about the end of a pencil eraser, you know, the eraser on the end of a pencil. And when we see them with macro shots and you see the speckles and striations, it's just so gorgeous. And we just love it. And we're like, I got to have that. And then you put it in your seven foot tank and there's this little flower <laughs> and you have to get on the glass and really look. And you're like, all right, yeah, that's pretty, but I need to see like a thousand to be happy. So that's kind of a, a, one of those ones that for me, I don't get into the zoanthid collecting because there is a, just, I need, I need too many of them to be able to appreciate them from three feet away. If I had a little small nano tank filled with zoanthids, I'd probably be in heaven. It'd be fantastic. And yes, there are a lot of different kinds. And the nice thing is that a lot of them just get along with each other, which is really, really cool. But no, no one's cooking them up in a lab. Oh my goodness, I got to the end of the chat. Thank goodness! I was about to say we're running out of time. So let's see. Skull Squadron says, I got a new fish. I'm having the hardest time getting it to eat. Well, first of all, how long have you had the fish? What is the fish? And what food are you using? Uh, whatever food you're using, you can always use different ones and you can use a little bit at a time so you're not polluting the tank badly trying to trick a fish into eating. The fish could be stressed from being acclimated. It could be stressed from other fish picking on it. Uh, you didn't tell me if there's any other fish or if it's just the new fish. There's just so much information I don't have to really give you help. But bottom line is we don't want to pollute the tank with too much food. So I always recommend using a little bit at a time. You can take foods and you can dissolve them in the water column so that it blows around little bits. Um, you can tether it down onto a rock down low. Uh, you can use pellet food, flake food. Um, you can use live foods like brine shrimp from the fish store. They usually sell that. Uh, certain places sell black worms, which some fish like to eat. And then, of course, there's frozen, which you would thaw out and then put in your tank. Sean wants an update on Minion's new home out back. Um, I will show you a picture. Let me dump it on my Mac really quick. Oh, you know what? I'm going to show you a couple things. Select. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, so we're going to wait for those to get on my Mac. Now I can drag them into Ecamm Live. So this is inside the studio right now. It's loading it. And there's my wall that I just put up yesterday. And you can see a large doorway in the center. And then there's two like giant gaping holes on the either side. And then there's some studs. And that giant hole is a four foot wide doorway. And then the two giant gaping openings are gonna be two sheets of acrylic that will be windows. And then on the end will be uh, a little bit of sheetrock here and a little bit of sheetrock on this side. I'm assuming you can see my cursor on your screen. So there's that. And then here is a picture from the front. And I need to put my decking on the top here. So this is eight feet tall and to the peak is 12 feet. So there's a decent amount of space up there. So I'll put decking on the top and I'll put joists from the back to the front to tie this together to make the room locked in so that front wall doesn't wiggle. Um, you can see the new flooring that I had put in a week ago. It's got a lifetime warranty. And then this picture here is the reef tank you're looking at in my background. That's what it looked like last night. And then finally, this is the post I was telling you guys about, about the urchins. And that's an actual video. So if you were on Boston Aquatics, there's the name. If you're on Boston Aquatics, you can actually check out these urchins and see them moving. I think it's time-lapsed. I think they're moving pretty quick, <laughs> if I remember correctly. So there's that. 
All right, guys, uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Let me see if there's any last minute questions. Oh, yeah, there were some questions. All right, so let's see. Marcus asked, does Live Rock Enhance have a shelf life? I bought you some, some from you a really long time ago, and I'm getting started again. It, it was in my fridge for a year and a half. Totally fine. Doesn't go bad. Jamie says, I am a tiler by trade and can confidently say porcelain tiles fitted well will be bulletproof. You're more likely to break the item dropped than the tile. I fit porcelain all the time. It's super strong. That's awesome. I don't plan to shoot it with my gun, but uh, I'd love to see it not break. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Alex says, what do you think about automatic water changes? Kamor has a special pump for it. Uh, if you can set it up and you got a nice area to do everything, you know, to pull water out, put water in, you sh yeah, go for it. Just make sure you stay on top of your salinity. It's really easy for that to get away from you when things are automated that much. And you just think, well, I'm putting in 1.026. I'm taking out 1.026. It'll never change. But your protein skimmer is taking a little bit of water every single day. Evaporation is still occurring. And evaporation can be greater or lesser. And salinity will change. And it typically, over time, will get lower and lower and lower, not, rather than higher and higher. So you want to make sure you watch out for that. Uh, Rosano says, any videos in your inventory about what to do if your tank is leaking? Oh, I'm sure I've got a few on that topic. Yes, you could check. Uh, maybe type in the word le uh, leak in the search box on my YouTube channel because <clears throat> I've talked about it a lot because it's happened to me a few times. Let's see. Manu Manuel, Manuel says, are you feeding as much as before with the smaller corals? Yeah, I don't change my feeding regime because I'm feeding the fish. Davi says, how high would you say is too high for calcium? I would say 500 is too high, and anything above it is way too high. 450 is usually the top end of what we recommend for a reef tank. So once you hit 5, it's bad. Let's see. Oh, okay, cursor doesn't show up. All right, well, now I know. Let's see. TSG says, how long can you keep live rock out of your tank while you're cleaning it? Well, I like to keep it wet the whole time. If you do take some rock out of your tank and you're cleaning it and you keep it submerged and you take it outside and then you take it and you're brushing it off or you're picking off algae or whatever you're doing and then submerge it back in water and then take it back in the house and put it back in the tank, it'll be fine. But if you expose it to air for 10, 20, 30 minutes, the, out, the uh, sponges that are on it or within it will start to die off and it could cause an ammonia spike. And we don't want that to happen. Reefkeeper says, can I use Live Rock Enhance and Reef Enhance on the same day? You can. Live Rock Enhance is used to clean the rock work, and Reef Enhance is a type of food to grow more bugs, you know, more pods. So you can use those. I believe both of those, well, I know for sure with Live Rock Enhance, you don't want to run UV for a few hours, and you can probably turn off your protein skimmer as well for a couple of hours. Hey, I like this rapid stuff at the end. How long can I keep live rock out of my tank while I clean the snails off the rock? How many snails do you have? I usually don't take the rock out to remove snails. <laughs> yes, I have trust issues. I don't trust automatic water changes. I don't trust my 250 gallon poly tank not flooding my entire home. That's a lot of salt water to go wrong if there's a point of failure where the tubing lets go. All right. Water test Saturday, I already mentioned earlier, please do test your water. We want to check alkaline, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate, temperature, pH, potassium, and maybe an ICP test just for the heck of it because it's a new year. Uh, if you're keeping track of your water parameters, your reef will do really well because water tests save lives. That is something that Caitlin said, and I will never stop saying it because it makes me think of her, and I miss her. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Um, today is the 15th. That means... When is, next Saturday is the 21st, right? 22nd. There probably will not be a live stream next weekend. So I just want to let you guys know so you're not looking for me next Saturday. I hope you guys have a great week. I will see you guys online. I'm, I can be found on Instagram 